And then he should be able to get in now. So Michelle, you can you can see when you're going over the names uh, in the attended list, you see the allow to talk button. Okay. And right now, I think you can't search because there's not enough people. But once once it populates and there's a lot of people, oh, I I just saw the search box appear on my side. Okay. Hi everyone who's joining us. We're just getting our Zoom um, room situated here, so we're 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 still a little early. So just bear with us for a second. Hi Gustavo. We just lost Gustavo. No. Gustavo is not. Can you hear me? Oh, there is Gustavo. How are you, Gustavo? Can you hear me? Hey. Yes. Would you like yes. to try, Gus? Um, if you can um, share a screen, would you like to do that? Sure. Give me just one second. One second. You take your time. Oh, I'm disabled. Can you oh, yeah. okay. enable me? There you go. Wow, I get caption. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> yes. Right, we see you. You see my screen? Yes, we see you. Um, Perfect. Of course, we also see the the the, um, the next slides to the left. Yeah, I, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna yes. shift to presentation mode when. Yes. when... Once we the, the procedure will be uh, my colleague Olivier Valeran, that is in the screen. He's in Montreal. He's presenting also today at a different place his own lecture. Um, so he was our helper um, and driving force here, I'm just the guy that talks. <laughs> uh, uh, Ray, Ray has been the uh, person setting everything up. So what we are okay. going to do, Michelle Cordova, please meet, meet Michelle. She will be Hello. Um, the person uh, briefly introducing um, to the audience the session and informing them about um, the credits that they can get through AIA and mm -hmm. all of those uh, important aspects. Then I will make a very brief intro. And then as we discuss, you will give your lecture and then Michelle will return. And she mm -hmm. will read to you the, the, the questions that she is receiving from the, the audience. Um, and um, about 2.40, 245, we will close so people can go to studio. And um, we are going to wait a few more minutes because people are just signing up and... Um, okay, so I, I would have, as, as I remember, about 50 minutes talk and then questions or including questions. No, 15 minutes, I think, um, what do you think? Um, yeah, uh, if you have 15 minutes, that will be great if somebody can give you the hint. So then we have, um, you know, 10, <laughs> that's, 15 that's, that's, minutes. That's perfect. That's perfect. I think that's what we've been at uh, for the other uh, speakers as well. And there's usually been about 10 minutes of questions after that. Okay. Yes. Um, so... So how, how are you? How is family? I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. Uh, very happy. Very grateful for the invitation. Yes, um, well, that we are honored. I, I just saw that you got a new award, major award. Uh, I saw that in your 
social media, but then I couldn't find it. Uh, but you just received a very important award. Is that correct? Yes, it was. Uh, we didn't know it. We didn't apply or or uh, uh, they contacted us. And apparently this uh, business association uh, in the United States looks at in the industry in the regions and selects like finalists. And then um, they go through uh, a process of juries and they, they chose us as the most innovative studio in, in North America for the last year, which was great gasoline given the context in which we've been. <laughs> yeah, well, that was very impressive because the, the article mentioned, then they couldn't find it, just so you know how organized I am. Um, but I saw that and I, I was so impressed. Um, before we begin the lecture, we are going to let other people to join us. Um, it takes some time, this process. Yeah, no worries. I want to let you know that, well, I just was thinking that March 24th, last year we were I was supposed to fly to Mexico City. And I remember really? that we will have dinner reservation. <laughs> but, uh, and then came, you know, uh, that's All true. You, you you had actually written me about it. Yeah, I yes. remember that. So next fall, we are working very actively through ASU to get um, the 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 vaccine. And if the, the, the flights are allowed and all the if and the powers to be allow us to uh, go. Um, I would like to take my six year small group of students, about 10, to Mexico City. And of course, I will begin to <laughs> ask you. And here is Philip Horton. Phil is our. Um, I think I know him. Member. I think I know you too now. <laughs> hey, good to see you. It's so good. How's, so great. how's the family? How's Lisa? They're, they're, they're doing well. They're on the other side of the screen too. Cheese. <laughs> well, uh, so I'm sure uh, she'll be happy to see you. Yeah, please tell her uh, uh, hello. You're looking a little skinny, man. Are you doing okay? Yeah, fortunately. <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's really great to see you. And and uh, I, I came in just as you were talking about being uh, recognized as the most innovative studio in North America. Uh, huge congratulations. So, so hey, excited. Phil, how about you? Um, Young man, um, I'm just glad to listen. Uh, how about Michelle doing the, um, the the brief intro, and then you feel as um, my colleague introduce um, Gustavo. I have a great introduction, but I'm sure that you will do it make much better. So, how about that? I, I don't know. I, I don't have an introduction prepared, uh, so I, that that sounds like a lot, but. Uh, so uh, Gustavo and I were, were uh, classmates uh, in the same yes. uh, MR class. And uh, I'm seeing Luis and, and Victor, who I, I think were both one year ahead of us. Uh, yes. Uh, Victor wrote, uh, this is like a little reunion. And uh, yeah. hopefully yes. I'm hopefully glad that Victor is there. Hopefully it's a pre it's great. Hopefully so, uh, sometime soon we can, we can have a, a real reunion in, in person. Well, that you know what awesome. happened today with Gustavo. Um, he posted in social media I'm, I'm, uh, to Luis and, you know, all the, that gang of wonderful students. <laughs> I still remember <laughs> you all, guys. Um, he wrote, today's my lecture on Tuesday the 23rd. And I thought like, oh, my God, I... I forgot about the lecture. I thought like, I, I know that I'm very old, but not that old. And then I realized that was today. So Goose, you need to pay more attention, not to scare older teachers like me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my, I'll do so. My story, uh, Jose, is uh, I tried to log in for this lecture exactly one month ago because it was Wednesday the 24th, in that case of February. So I sent a oh, note really? to Ray and I said, Ray, I can't get into the lecture. Can you help me get in? He goes, Phil, that's next month. <laughs> and so, yeah, he scared uh, me. No, yeah, but, but to the, this morning I saw that and I thought like, 
How could I forget about Gustavo Sledge? <laughs> anyway, I think we have a um, we have been um, waiting for the audience to. Kari Adriano Uribe Fajardo, raise your hand. I think you're um, good to start, Jose. Yeah, we are going to start, and then um, we are going to uh, have everybody asking questions. This is like a small reunion, Gustavo. <laughs> That's what I'm seeing. <laughs> yes. Um, all right. So um, we are ready, Michelle. Thank you for joining us. Well, hello everyone. Thank you very much for attending today's lecture event. Again, my name is Michelle Cordova. I'm currently a graduate student in the Masters of Interior Architecture, and I'm delighted to be able to be a part of the lecture series today. And I'll be filling in for Olivier um, and will help facilitate with Jose. So I'm very excited as today to introduce Gustavo Camarona, um, and he's gonna be going over the assembly, materiality and atmosphere if you have any questions throughout the lecture, if you can please use the Q&A option um, and then your questions will be shared after the guest lecture. And then with that, I will turn it over to Jose to introduce uh, Gustavo. Well, thank you, Michelle. This is going to be a very quick intro um, of a um, beloved um, friend and also one of our alums from the School of Architecture. Um, basically, I wanted to put in place uh, Gustavo's uh, materials work uh, in the context of Mexican um, architecture and design. Um, as you probably know, Mexico offers today one of the most innovative and um, more important uh, grounds for design and architecture. And Materia, the um, office that Gustavo and his wife, Lisa Beltran created around 2006, I believe, it has found a, a voice, a very important emerging voice um, among a large group of studios that are very important contributing today to um, uh, contemporary architecture. Looking at his work, I would like just to, uh, to say uh, two things about the work that you are going to see in this um, lecture. One most, the most important characteristics of Materia's work is for me the sensorial assemblage of experience through craft and materials. So what you are going to see is uh, the senses being reflected in a very meticulous, very well craft work to enhance the experience of those that are fortunate to walk through it and is done through um, this uh, absolutely love for drawing and materials. As thinking about you, Gustavo, and also Lisa, I remember you being an important part of the first time that I taught a class on Latin America. And I understood, um, surrounded by students from all over the wonderful continent that is South America, Central America, North America, uh, that I was completely wrong. I was calling that, that, that class Latin American design and architecture. And I understood that it was many architectural voices and designs in Latin America. So um, in that first class, I learned immensely from you. I'm glad to introduce uh, Gustavo Carmona, I think you will see a voice that is not only Mexican, but is very important for design, for contemporary design. Thank you, Gus, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it was, uh, I was very grateful and excited since the moment I received the invitation from, from Jose. And uh, it is a, a very special significance to to be speaking to, uh, to the students of ASU. Of course, I would much desire to be doing it in person, but as we know it, times have changed 
but nevertheless, it's it's great to think that it's been uh, 20 years this August since um, I met uh, your professor Philip Horton and many other uh, great friends uh, in the desert. And um, I'm gonna try to walk you through our work. Um, I, I, uh, cognizant of the fact that when, when we start working as architects, uh, we not necessarily know exactly everything we wanna uh, think about or, or, or research, but you know we have tons of energy. And I remember coming out of ASU just you know, fueled. Uh, it was for me a, a, an opportunity for uh, starting to uh, sow a thought process that uh, would start being more intuitive at the beginning and then with the years and with the help of um, the studio has become more, much more conscious and um, aligned in, in you know, or, or making sense to put it some way. That's me uh, and I, I put it because it's important to always uh, be kids. Uh, when we listen to architects in lectures or books, uh, they become less of a person. And um, it is important to be happy if you're gonna be doing architecture. Otherwise, uh, the hassle is, is too big. And as a kid, uh, my context growing in, in Mexico uh, had to do with this uh, factory in the state of Veracruz, my father, uh, used to run a processing uh, factory for uh, woodlocks, uh, whether they were for uh, trains or for telephone posts. And I would go with him and play along these, you know, spaces and, and, and arrangements of, of wood everywhere. And little did I know that that would actually influence me uh, very deeply in the future. And as Mexican, we are always surrounded by history. Sometimes maybe that history is too heavy on us, but the issues of monumentally, uh, monumentality, um, uh, stone, carving, shadow, light, are so present in every single part of the country and in every single thing of our culture, uh, whether it's modern or it's uh, you know older than that or, or pre-Hispanic or contemporary, architecture has a very strong presence in our everyday life. Um, and I think that's something that it is shared as, as Jose was saying by uh, many of the different voices in, in Latin American culture. But Mexico is the clashing of, of, of many cultures and, and a, a, a very rich history. Later, when I was um, a teenager, I traveled to Rome as a basketball player. I might have been the tallest Mexican, if you could have seen if I was speaking to you today physically. I'm six foot seven, um, six foot six lately, actually, <laughs> age. Um, so, uh, but I, I, I got to go to Rome and I actually played in this stadium by Pierli Ginelli. And I remember just, just being amazed by the structure, how the structure became part of the expression of the building. And I always thought I, I wanted to do something like that someday. Uh, later on, I, I, I visited this place in San Francisco, uh, St. Mary's um, Cathedral, which is great. And of course, surrounded by, by the legacy of, of bargain and, and color and expression in, in Mexico is something that uh, it's unavoidable. Uh, so when I landed at ASU, that is on 2001, I remember coming out of the airport and, and getting the heat wave and thinking, what am I doing here? Where are the trees? <laughs> and uh, with time, of course, uh, th there was a lot developed uh, with the light in the desert, with how the shadows uh, take over throughout the day uh, the mountains, the ranges, the city, and, uh, and the, ex the, the uh, sensory experience that, that becomes actually our first project. Uh, our first studio project was to do something um, in Papago Park. And I, I, I thought it would be funny to put some of my 
student work from that time. And when I was looking at it, I, I thought, you know, it's, it's interesting to see that I was already uh, sort of interested in the spaces in between in these voids articulating the different programs or helping read the landscape. And at the same time, uh, interested in, in the connections of the piecing of the things, of the details on, on how the materials would actually meet. Um, I was also, you know, taken by, by always trying to work with darkness and light at the same time. And when I worked on my thesis, I chose a very, um, uh, and, and in, in downtown Mexico City, there were these abandoned buildings that I took over in the void spaces and created what I thought it was going to be a museum. And at the end of the day, it was not even a museum. It was just you know, space. Uh, I was a student of Claudia Bechstein, uh, to whom I admire a lot. And I, I had a great uh, amount of learning with him. And the project became more about you know, the transitions, just wandering through the project, understanding connections, understanding the different languages of materials and and, and those voids, uh, I used to call it the uh, tectonic voids of Mexican memory. And I was interested in how those connections or the places where materials meet would actually be reading the time and, and then enacting different layers of history within the site. And during my, my time at ASU, I also visited this place as part of the Wendell Burnett Studio, uh, who was also a, a great mentor um, in, in my career. Um, this is the Kimball Art Museum in, in Fort Worth. And I remember just being uh, totally amazed by, by this uh, building, you know, realizing that Louis Kahn was a poet, he was a, an artisan, he was also a very pragmatic um, uh, architect in terms of how he resolved the program and the connection he could actually achieve uh, with the place around. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a tissue that's, uh, that's me in the left uh, in the studio, uh, first of all. And I, I met my life, who's uh, my, my it's been my partner in every single sense. Lisa, um, she's also an architect and we graduated even with a family from ASU. So it was, as you can imagine, a very intense uh, experience. And it, it is important to understand that you can't separate work and life. It, it has to be all, all together. You have, we have the chance of understanding what we do, not as a service, not as a profession only, but as a vocation. So in that sense, you have to try to, you know, saw around full circle. And, you know, this is a, a, a woman that I'm very grateful for because she's, she has pushed me as an architect and as a person uh, all of my life. Um, and, you know, architecture is not devoid of, of these things. Um, we, we worked for a while in California after graduating uh, in, in, at ASU, and then we decided we would move to Mexico City to start our own deal. And, uh, you know, these were some of our merely decent first projects <laughs> after many remodels of uh, bathrooms and rooftops and uh, gardens. And we did a, a little store, we did a dental suite, and, you know, and it's, it's what I call the five S's. I used to call them four, but now there's a new S there. The first S is studying, right? You go to school, uh, you know, you're, you're devoted to, to, to thinking and, and imagining architecture. And right after you come out to the second S, which is uh, survival. And that's when, you know, reality bites and, and that's when it starts. And survival is harsh. So again, you need to be happy if you want to be an architect. And it took a while to reach the third is, which is um, stability. Uh, and stability meaning you are able to do what interests you and have the enough resources to have the time to put some mind into it. Uh, before than that, it's just crazy. So. We, we got this house in Mexico City where we had to build. 
And it is important to say that we started building our own projects. And that gave us a keen sense of an, an understanding of how materials behave, what are the processes, what do you need to do first and, and, and last in, in, in a project. And of course, you know, there's, there's many mistakes in the road. I think uh, we've done much more mistakes than, uh, but I like to think that every mistake is new and different. I think um, we need to have the eyes open to learn from the mistakes we do. Um, architect, ar architecture is also human in a sense. So uh, we worked with brick. The clients wanted to, to work uh, with brick. All the houses were brick around, uh, but they were very classical, the same thing. So we use brick as the structure the, the, and, uh, and as a formwork. Basically, the walls of this house are um, put in place concrete and the brick is set prior to the pouring of the concrete and is left there. So accommodating and, and, and laying out every single brick precisely, it was an incredible deal and amount of detail for a first construction house and we actually got it out in budget. So that was a, a, an incredible deal. And, and you can see how the bricks started to talk a different thing, you know, I must say that we started doing this house with a visual design. And the more we dealt with the construction and understood the material, it started talking back to us and saying, you know, how, how it holds the shadows when there's depth to it. Uh, what's the empathy created around it when, you, when things are aligned? I, I remember in, during school, reading uh, Gottfried Semper talking about the concept of empathy in architecture and how when everything has a sense of alignment, proportion, um, well thinking all around, it creates that empathy with the user. And so that was, that was a big deal for us in our first house that was back in 2009 when we finished that. And Little after that, we got this, com this incredible commission in, in Portugal. We thought we were going to be doing an interior renovation, uh, or that's what the client said. And when we got the drawings, we found out, you know, this was in north of uh, Porto in Portugal. And it, that was the project when, when it was given to us. It was a 300-year-old quinta that had to be restored and then the spaces were divided into different brothers and one of, one of them wanted us to, to, to make their home based on what they've seen in the other house. So needless to say, we, we, we went to Portugal many times, we were very fortunate. And one of the lessons um, I'll never forget is how they dealt with surface, with the speeds and, and, and the different platforms and stepping nature of the streets and the, the intricacy and, and how they build anticipation. And that's, I think, when we started to realize uh, unconsciously about the power of working towards atmosphere. This is uh, us in our first trip uh, to coordinate building and, and understanding how they built was amazing. Uh, this is the context you know, uh, grapevines around, orange trees, it was just amazing. Uh, so we, we had to rebuild the house as it was originally said 300 years ago in terms of the roof and, and the mat exterior materials, but we could organize the house uh, all together inside. So we decided not to touch the existing quote unquote uh, and do all of these new programs as separate volumes or pavilions, emphasizing their material. This is our, our model and it shows how uh, the rooms were on the left upper side in this much more encased area of the house. The walls were already existing, but they were two feet wide walls made out of uh, granite. And then the public area, um, was, uh, was said to have all of these uh, loose volumes. This was the, uh, the section. So again, you can see how we tried here to 
enact different heights and levels so that the transition of, of, of the persons or the inhabitants going from one place of the house to the other uh, could actually uh, get in touch with different speeds and, 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 and lengths of time uh, and thresholds to go from one place to the other. This is the plan uh, where you can see the bedrooms on the right and all of the public areas, including kitchen, a studio with a gym, an office, and the living and dining area, much more open. And this was a second conversation in this time with, with Stone. So we couldn't decide the openings in, in the paper. We had to be there understanding what stones were set there from, from the start and seeing the possibilities of opening a window or a door or pouring concrete just to hold the wall and not let it fall. Uh, so we were designing, we had designed an intention that was finalized during construction. And it is important because it's, it's, it's the only way where architects uh, assure not losing the understanding of making. You know, when we sit for years on a desk and we rarely go to construction sites and we do not touch the material or understand the efforts or, or of working with the material, it becomes, it, it, it's, um, it, it's uh, something that works actually against us. And that led us to understand, or, or today we think that we are certainly, uh, as architects, we can be more of an artisan, much more than an artist, because art in itself, it's um, useless. I mean, I, I could be killed for what I said. You don't need it to live, but if you have it, you're gonna have a much better life, right? But architecture is useful and pragmatic, and at the same time, it needs to be beautiful. So the best, um, the best comparison that I found is that of the artisan, that of the one who makes uh, vases or, you know, uh, swords or any type of craft. They understand the material, they understand their use, its process, and then it serves a purpose that is enhanced with a ritual, much more than just a program. So here, I think we started unconsciously getting that message here. How could we put that in the details that could go into you know, a shower? Do you actually shower or do you cleanse yourself? Uh, does the stair need to be the same all of the time? What about you know, connecting the new with the old doorknobs? Uh, we were de detailing everything. Uh, the Portuguese contractor was actually uh, surprised that we were providing as many drawings as as we were sending uh, these some of the spaces like the kitchen it was like a kitchen with no doors uh, but we were it was it was well planned this is the final look of, of, of the exterior and we found you know opportunities in the way like this sunken courtyard that was actually not something initially planned, but we found that there was this uh, foundation that was so expensive to take out this concrete wall. So we just, you know, dug the space and, and, and made it inhabitable and, and created this uh, fountain there so you could have the echo. So echo becomes like uh, light or wind or, uh, or temperature. It, it becomes a factor of erosion of the material. You know, the, the echo helps you read the material through sound. And we're so used to just experiencing the material and the space through visual means nowadays. It's, I think they're overrated. Um, so we like things when they can be touched, when, when, when they provide a, a quality that is beyond the typical measures. And that's, that's in itself the concept of materiality. Materiality is not the, uh, the list of materials or the catalog of materials you have in the project. What is is the thing that exceeds the material that jumps out. It's like when you say, you know, that wood looks, you know, warm to me or, or, or this place is cold. Uh, 
they are expressing something beyond, but there needs to be work and a work of uh, distilling the, mat the material to, so that it can express uh, different things when putting um, in contracts or put to the erosion of, of the uh, natural phenomena. This again, talking about the thresholds of coming up the house and uh, finding the bedrooms, but the steps have different lengths. Uh, there's, there's entries of light in different moments of the day. Uh, and it becomes something that starts to be a little bit more intimate or sacred. Again, there's a ritual to, uh, to it. So these spaces in between become not just a functional hallway, but in a sense, the soul of the house where uh, traversing is, is enjoyable. And it was, it was incredible because uh, we had done those little stores and that got us into an interview with, with, with Burberry. Uh, and, you know, we, we, little did we know that we, it was gonna unleash uh, an incredible um, uh, story after that. Uh, today we've done, uh, we started doing small corners and actually we started supervising um, their stores. We were not even uh, documenting nor designing their stores. But with time, I think the relationship and, and our DNA lent for, for um, the circumstances for us to be documenting their projects and eventually to actually provide design and, uh, to them. But where we met mentally was not whether we were specialists in retail, but I think now that it's uh, because we were both interested in detail in every sense of, of, of the matter. And, uh, you know, later on, we started, you know, proposing and designing some of the facades for the brand. And I found this graphic as I was uh, preparing the, the lecture. We did, for Burberry, we've done over 90 projects in seven or eight different countries. And uh, it was insane. For a while, I was going to Brazil or Panama or Bogota every two weeks. Uh, I had this uh, super titanium <laughs> airline pass at some point. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was also incredible because beyond doing that, we were again getting an acute sense of the process of making and making fast, but very precisely. So our notions for detail got even uh, bigger. We got this opportunity to design this uh, screen for Burberry for Mexico City, and it was just putting it together on the shop to, to gauge the scale and, and the assembly the correctness in the assembly was, was incredible. It was made out of aluminum extrusions and we designed the molds and, and the cuts and everything. It was, it was incredible. It was a beautiful project. And little after that, we were contacted by Louis Vuitton. And I think it, is, it would be very difficult to separate the story of our studio uh, without speaking about Louis Vuitton because like any other brand uh, in the world, they have an incredible genuine interest in design and an identity and execution. And they pushed our, our boundaries and our, our, our standards every single time um, during their project. So we were given this project in Cancun. They wanted to have a, a fully a full uh, stone facade. And I have to be honest, I was not very convinced and uh, I, I always like to do the uh, odd questions. Uh, I'd rather be told no than not ask. So we started doing some uh, mock-ups in the office, uh, some sketches like you see here. This is our way of everyday working. And I got one of our carpenters to work out this model. <clears throat> we took pictures and we sent them out to Paris and we never heard, them, heard from them. Uh, so I thought, you know, 
<clears throat> we should be uh, quiet, but about, <clears throat> sorry, about a month later, they called back and say, you know, they, they, they've seen it, they want it. So <laughs> make it happen. So I remember telling Carla, my, my associate, uh, you know, we have to find out what wood is she caravan using because this is going for real. So uh, this is the project where I felt my, for the first time, my legs um, cramping a little bit in the sense that I had to make, the, we had to make this happen uh, in every single detail, in every single sense. And it was great. It was just um, uh, an incredible experience. And, and I remember touching these pieces of wood, certifying every single one and, and detailing something that could speak to the identity of the brand, but at the same time that it could actually provide a, um, a, 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 an urban connection because the avenue that was passing there was um, uh, high speed. So you, you had to see this quickly and, and see how it changed with your movement, have some uh, kinesthetic character to it. Um, we, we actually got to design the ceiling, which was crazy and, and, and different to what, you know, is usually done in, 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 or it was usually done at the time in, in, in the Louis Vuitton stores. And that, this project became uh, a project in itself as it evolved eventually into other stores. What, uh, what happens with Louis Vuitton is that in Latin America, they, they want to open you know, 20 stores. So if they go to a place like uh, Panama, for instance, uh, you know, it, it will be the only one, it, it will become the, um, the flagship. So the architectural language of the brand had become wood for Latin America now. And they wanted us to, uh, to take it to a next level trying to set the flower of their identity into the panels and, and you know, make it very, uh, you know, with, with, with a great deal of craft. So we did this uh, facade in, in uh, Santiago in Chile and also in Panama. And I've seen there's one of a dear friend and client Landis uh, had joined the conference at the beginning. So this, this facade, I, I did uh, with the help of, uh, we did together with the help of Landis and Jose Carlos, in another great client in, in Paris. And it was huge. It was just a big deal. And, and trying, as architect, it's not only about designing and putting details and, and ideas into, into uh, paper and documents. It's how you actually convince and, uh, every single other person involved in making architecture possible to jump into the matter with the same degree of quality and commitment and detail. Uh, detail, in a sense, is not so much about, you know, little connections or, 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 or you know, the tiny corners. Detail is that conscious intention present in everything. So sometimes detail is the whole building, uh, or most of the times it should be. At the same time, we were doing this office building in, Mex in, in, Veracruz, in the state of Veracruz in Mexico. And it was a very straightforward building. Developers, clients, they wanted you know, open office space, no place or no money for a lot of you know, playfulness. So we, we only had one chance, which was uh, making the facade, but given the climate and given the, um, the corrosion that exists in the coast of Veracruz and the humidity and, and, and the sun bashing on the windows every single day. We thought the important thing was to create this uh, threshold and filter in the facade uh, to create a terrace and, and make the identity of, of, of the building. So we use this very low cost uh, cellulose uh, uh, cement block that has uh, some um, qualities in, in temperature control, and it could be a structural as well. And it was great. This, this facade was, of course, 25 times less expensive than the one in Louis Vuitton with the same area. But it was, it was a big lesson in which um, design does not depend necessarily on uh, money or creativeness does not, uh, neither does uh, craft. 
and something so simple with the means of uh, sameness and difference and repetition creates these um, you know incredible games of light during the whole day and, and and again that sweet space that articulates the experience of the whole building it's very very simple building very uh, economic and uh, along came some houses in in mexico city they were all in this in the hilly uh, outskirts of, of the city, very complicated pieces of land. And we were into concrete at that time. This is about 2000, 2012, 2013. And they were all very wealthy clients in the sense they wanted these humongous houses. And it's hard to deal with uh, large scale in residential, in single residential, because uh, you're dealing with a lot of ego as you're building these things or designing them. So how do you keep them being something amicable and um, comfortable and, and, and friendly? It, it, it's important. Um, this is uh, a crazy house, but I, everything was done in concrete. So it was a lot of exploration with the put in place concrete. We had to integrate the structure and uh, and the expression of architecture in one thing. So um, a lot of phone work. And I remember visiting the uh, every week, I would spend at least maybe six hours uh, in every visit in this house. Just the spaces in between the framing were just amazing. Almost wishing like if they wouldn't have to be taken apart at some point. Uh, and supervising how the framework had to be accommodated in such a way that uh, it would express all of the joints that we wanted. And when, when you do concrete, you're really designing the formwork more so than the poor thing. And otherwise, it's just not going to come out how you want it. And at that point, I think it was a, a moment of discovery about the power of the joint and the seam in, in that moment where materials or, or different geometry faces or surfaces are gonna touch. It's like uh, I commonly stated as, as um, the analogy of two people kissing, just that brief moment where the leaves are almost you know, touching, uh, it's even much more powerful than <clears throat> the kiss itself. And that's where the seam and the joint uh, come into play and, and provide lightness to something that is not light. I had seen this detail in uh, the Salk Institute by Louis Kahn making, uh, inverting the chamfer in the formwork so that the concrete would actually spill out and create these little lines of, uh, of shadow. And I, you know, it was just incredible to be, to make this and I like these pictures because during the process before the program becomes too evident in the space, it's just a matter of space of, of just being there and, and letting the material express itself. And when you understand the amount of work in thinking or drawing or supervising or building this has, then it speaks uh, through itself, I believe. And then the presences, you know, the, how a wall is not just a wall, it's, it's the opportunity for a, a tree to generate presence, to inhabit the space, to, to make the shadow one more material in the, uh, in the experience of the house. You, you can, this, this picture is insane because you can see all of the little dots. I'm gonna have to go way faster. Um, this is another house uh, in Mexico City. Again, talking about process, talking about you know concrete now meeting wood and 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 dealing with those joints and uh, and the tensions between the materials. Hilly side as well. And and always the sky the sky is this infinite veil on top of us and architecture brings us the opportunity 
to define the edge of the sky in, at any given moment. So our responsibility of how to finalize buildings on the top is humongous uh, for that sense. I, I love to walk like in places like New York or San Francisco or big cities where you can look up and, and see how all of these skyscrapers define a very intricate uh, line. Uh, you know, it's an it's a enclosed portion of the sky. And then letting the light wash down. And you know, it's, when you think of light traveling billions of you know, miles to actually hit the world you have designed or imagined and giving it its sense of belonging, it's, uh, it's great. Uh, this house was also in, in a very hilly site and we had to reverse the program. We had to actually come up the entry was the garage and then cross a bridge and then managed to, for the house to go down as the, it would get the programs more intimate, the lower you, you went because otherwise we would have built a platform structure and, and, and top which didn't make any sense. So even in, in our renderings and graphics at the time we were interested in, in making sure that the intentions of light intruding or shadow casting were, um, were evident. And, and the stair becomes, again, that, that piece of space that entails the movement along the house be, becomes the most important thing. Very discreet from the outside, natural materials, concrete, steel, in, in their own form and, and finish. And again, the intention of maybe when you change levels, you change form work. So you're expressing something different within the same material. Um, the idea of having different languages using one single material is, is, is uh, it's amazing. Or stone. And, I think in, in some of the houses we've been bad in terms of the interiors in the sense that we have designed the houses so much in certain sense that sometimes our, our clients have a, a, a difficulty of how to <laughs> furnish them. Not this, that's not necessarily good, but uh, I love this picture because these stones protruding could actually cast a shadow that would actually make the whole wall black at some point in the day. So it, it also takes observing, you know, as architects, we need to, uh, I like the term, deeply observe our surroundings, uh, nature, life itself, people, uh, because there's many lessons that come back into play as we are imagining uh, places. Uh, we were assigned this, um, this project in Merida, Merida is a, booming city in Mexico. I currently actually live in Merida and travel back every other week to, uh, to our office in Mexico City. And this is a 19th century house in the main avenue downtown. Historic, it's a museum. It has all the original art and furniture inside. And, and they used to rent the gardens for events like this. And they got tired of, the, uh, of these tents. Uh, so they want us to do a roof or that's what they said. They want. Uh, they want a room. So we, we studied and we thought it, it had to be something to actually pay homage to the house and frame the sky and, and make the sky be the event or, or, or the sunsets. And whenever it had to hold an event, it could actually do it well. But how could you do something contemporary and integrate with the old? Um, so we thought we should do a pavilion and we abstracted the notion of rooms from the house and inverted into the open space. It was our first project designing just open space, no program at all, except for the fact that events need to be able to take place. So you can see that there's different scales within one space or different spaces within one space. Rooms that speak to the same nature of rooms that have the house um, and then how to do it fast and with the available traits in Merida. 
uh, because you know they couldn't close the business more than two months. So everything had to be in prefabricated concrete, uh, and then you know fabricate it in the factory, and then just come and, and, and put it up. So we took about three months at the end, but it, we came up with these type of details where the column meets the panels, and we create this very gentle um, veil on top. You're going to see in a few more slides. And working, understanding the pouring and the fabrication of these pieces allowed us to understand the mold and how the mold could actually not just create uh, seams or indentations because of need to unmold the piece, but use that as an ornament that could actually create a language that uh, would foster integration with a previous, uh, with a pre-existing building. Again, the edge of the sky, the amount of detail and how the panels come together. This is a process of construction. And at the end, it, it, it's, it's, it's just a, a silent pavilion that could just stay empty or have a wedding. Or in fact, one of the first events they had the uh, Cuban president and the Mexican president back in the day, um, this pavilion pushed beyond architecture because it made the, the, the family, the owners, uh, the house became a, a more, uh, rather than just be a place for social encounter, they became a, a cultural institution. The, the museum got boosted and, and something happened. They, they, just, they were not just thinking of the place uh, the same. This got us the, uh, the uh, um, the Biennale uh, Award in 2015 for cultural buildings in, in the Mexico City's Biennale of Architecture. And again, the shadow, the, the trees presencing in the space, uh, in the columns. And we were also having some fun uh, with uh, interiors. Um, and, you know, I, I must say that I still have a some problem dealing with the notion of interiors and exteriors because I believe architecture is interiorizing the world. And the separation happens today clearly because of how the service provision in the world uh, is paid. But an architect cannot quit to the uh, embedded relationship that, you know, exterior and interior spaces have. Uh, we were invited to design week and we did a, the first year we did this like little tree house uh, or sort of tree house. It was more of a, you know, fun exercise really quickly within the design house where different architects and interior designers are invited to, uh, to, to design a room of the house. We did something exterior. And then the next year we did a, a bedroom this house was set for demolition after the event. So we decided to use, you know, sort of like have, you know, demo work paired with design. And it was interesting. But the more we went, you know, after certain years, the more we became interested in the idea of durating uh, through time, of contemplating, or of not just, of, of the need to be present. We live in a world that we are so, um, bombarded by, by media, by information, by the speed, by the adrenaline, we have lost the ability to consciously breathe and just, you know, just, just feel. So we did this space, which uh, was like a critique in a sense to, to the design house. It was a, a contemplating space and was quite successful. People would actually stay there for hours. And the next time they invited us, it was not a design house, it was like a design building. It was an apartment building, uh, four stories high. And we took the, uh, instant, you know, the uh, MEP shaft um, that uh, to do this, what we call the uh, duration chamber. And the idea was just for people to actually go there, lay down, no other sense of design, just, just the sky and, and these hovering cube framing the sky. And uh, we have been working with a company called Neil Fay for some Riviton projects, and they were very interested in our work. So they actually helped us 
designed these uh, uh, plates that had this one millimeter wrinkle that could actually read the shadow uh, very slightly and, and, and frame your view. And this is it, this is the people. This was a, a bunch of uh, ladies visiting the house and just spending their 20 minutes and, and just, again, uh, understanding that it's us that go through time and not the other way around. One day we, we were coming to, to visit the place and we found Mario Botta sitting, <laughs> sitting in the platform and, and being very happy with the project. And that, that led us to, to be invited to design what is sort of like the Serpentine Pavilion version, uh, Mexican version, which is uh, the uh, Tamayo Pavilion. Uh, every year by the uh, Tamayo Museum in the Chapultepec Forest, which is like our central park. And I wanted to refer or, or pay homage a little bit to my father and to that experience that I had as a kid. And we designed these two towers, one of concrete, one of wood, thinking of the way they used to stack uh, the logs in the factory and, and make it the space inside uh, inhabitable. But then we, we developed the idea a little bit more and uh, it became a repetition of, of the most single section uh, uh, that we could find for that. You know, the, the section is the, the minimal expression of, of, of the making of space, right? Is there something that defines your space vertically? So we thought, let's just two materials, one single type of connection. Let's just repeat and play with with variants uh, to create something, to actually shred the context and, and break it apart and, uh, and read it differently. These are the models. And, you're, and, and being, you know, besides a building like this by Teodoro Gonzalez and, and, uh, and Abraham Sabludowski was just an incredible responsibility. So this is construction, sorry if I'm going a little bit faster. Prefab uh, concrete columns, uh, wood beams, and, and the chance of taking the concrete, reinterpreting the concrete from the museum into our pavilion, and the wood from the from the park into our uh, roof or lattice, and creating these. Uh, uh, it was more of a tool. Uh, to read the passing of time, honestly, more so than a building or, 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 or something else. It would change every single second, whether there was a cloud passing or rainy day or the angle of the sun. So it was intended to be there for three months. It ended being there for about nine to 10 months uh, because of the people using it and going through it and, and sitting there just to watch. And here, the importance, this takes back to the importance of the assembly taking part in, in constructing the materiality and thus the atmosphere. And when, I, I, I don't think we do architects, we don't do architecture by designation. Like, I, I believe that's too arrogant in itself. Um, otherwise, we would be surrounded by incredible architecture everywhere we go. I think we do architectural work and that when we are filled with enough intentions that would make the work worthy enough, it may be appropriated by the people, whether it is a store or it's a hotel or a house. And if that happens, I guess it has much more chances to become a place. And that's when architecture appears and, and you know, if that happens, it's a, a great privilege. Um, but if we're a little bit more humble in, in when we're making these things, I think we have more chance to do something that could be significant. Um, I'm gonna pass through these examples of, you know, stores we were reinterpreting right, as interior experiences. We were trying to change the way people shop or uh, relate to uh, merchandise. And what if instead of having a lot of fixtures or a lot of pieces of furniture, we would have these 
one fixture that was a space at the same time, uh, able to carry many types of collections and things. Uh, and this was actually a redo we had on this store. This is in 2017. We had done the original store in 2010. And we were very glad to demo at that store <laughs> because it was like a piñata. <laughs> um, again, very simple materials, black, wood, steel, light. And we were given a few restaurants in recent years. And we took this one. And the shape of the interior was, was terrible. We only had an interior here. And again, how do you make your interior an exterior in some sort? But when you have to force the people to actually read the interior shape of, of, of a site, because that was just like, you know, somebody who didn't have enough intention of a nice experience design, we have to decompose it. So the restaurant was called Tatemar, which means to burn, referring to cook. Uh, so we, we, we wanted to do uh, a restaurant that could, where light and material could be like fire to food, right? So we actually burned our concrete with uh, charcoal powder. Uh, we, you know, as it was drying, we were actually asking uh, the construction crew to, 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 to put it with their hands and, uh, we try to interpret different materials like the clay, like, like the concrete, like the resin hanging from the ceiling to create this much more organic and, and darker experience. Um, and I, I, I think we were very successful in tying into the identity of the chef and the food. And, um, okay, I have zero minutes, uh, Jose, can I, can I steal 10 more minutes? If your lecture, um, Gustavo, I would like to keep a few minutes also for um, your friends to ask difficult questions. So, um, okay, I'm, I'm closer to lecture? the end. Okay, um, so based on the pavilion we have done, uh, the, the family, the family uh, asked us. To think of something else behind the pavilion, and we th we thought we wanted to do a cultural center because the cultural scene in Merida and the community is growing so much that they also want to give something back to the, to the to the city. So we were going back at some point in trying to convince the whole family to the Salk Institute, where we actually uh, we also visited the National Museum. This is. This meeting with the whole family, with the director of the National Museum took place at the same moment where in Mexico City we were having the earthquake in, back in 2017. Um, and this is, this is the lady that owns the house and she's an, an incredibly generous and, and brave person because she, at some point she trusted in, in the vision we provided and, and she, she said, okay, let's go ahead, let's build a cultural center. And, and of course we've learned a lot about how to build cultural agendas. There's now a, 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 an external counseling and there's a new director for the cultural center. We've learned much more beyond architecture. Uh, so it's been a great experience. This project is currently um, being built. And again, reinterpreting concrete, but first understand what can concrete do to cast shallow or to receive the shadow or to break the light and then understand how it comes together as a system that could be innovative, unique, and integrated with the previous architecture. I'm gonna skip through this a little bit faster. These are some of the renderings of the project, and you can see that it speaks to the language of the pavilion, yet with a slightly different uh, and, or more orthogonal uh, character to it. These are pictures from you know, the past weeks uh, where light and, and, and sky and shadow are starting to become playful with uh, the building itself. These are from yesterday, actually, these pictures. I said porticos again, the threshold as the space. Um, I'm gonna go quickly through this. This is a, an LV store we did in Mexico City that where we took 
way far out the idea of the screen as a double sided screen from inside and out. And it was like the pinnacle or the conclusion of, of the series of uh, facades we have been decided, designing uh, all together with uh, a team in, in Paris. It was an incredible challenge. And you can see how the interior atmosphere is actually defined and, and subdued by, by the screen. And this has been maybe one of the most, uh, the biggest challenges I've, I've ever had this tour, uh, also for Louis Vuitton in South portion of Mexico City. The scale was uh, incredibly big uh, within the mall, which was already, uh, you know, a, a big mall in a very urban uh, setting. And they wanted to do something very, very different and go um, away from the wood. And, I feel so very grateful to them because this is where I felt they gave us the most freedom ever uh, in proposing and, and engaging with us in, in discussions about uh, the store. So we had to deal with the geometry, uh, a very you know, slanted diagonal angles uh, store. This is some of the sketches uh, we did as part of the concept. And we were gonna do it in concrete. So um, this is the rendering. And they was figuring out how to do this, uh, even if it was tilted uh, in concrete. So it was pre-stressed concrete or post-stressed concrete. So technically, th th there's so much, as you dive into the technical aspects of, of designing and building, that's when you have to remember or have in mind all the time what the materiality wants to do. Uh, towards the, uh, the experience of the, uh, of the building or the place. Um, these are some of my initial uh, sketches to solve the uh, construction system. And I have to say that none of the systems that we've done ever, we knew how to make them for the first time. It's a lot, it takes a lot of time into research and asking the right questions and getting close to the right engineers. And again, providing them with a vision to jump into this uh, along with you and making it happen. So we designed these high density latex molds. These are some, of, this is the mock-up, full scale mock-up at some point for the brand to approve. That's me being happy because the mock-up was approved. <laughs> and um, you can see here the results. Just how, how material that's so heavy in nature could become light, could become a screen, could become a reader of, of uh, the phenomena around it. And also become attuned with the identity of, of its owner. I'm, I'm gonna pass through these uh, images, uh, but we're trying to instill in you the notion of crafting the material every time there's a new this is ceramic, so understanding ceramic now, making it with artisans in Oaxaca, creating a, a, a special building system for these type of walls. And again, making them become the interior and exterior um, character of the building. And lastly, um, this is, this is a very uh, more emotionally charged building. It was a house built in the 50s in, in the Yucatan coast. And we had to rebuild it because it was falling apart. So we, we had to bring it down and put it up again, but we kept the design, we kept the intent and the style, uh, to put it some way, to create this patio. Um, the house used to be just an L shape here. So we created a, a sec, uh, an inverted L to create this patio. And this is for, for a family, a very large family that has you no know, siblings and many others. But it's very basic, very little budget. And we were pushed to go back to basics, to, for space, for light, for um, temperature. Uh, but again, making the portico be that threshold 
frame views uh, and engaging with the shadow, with the light to create the sense of place and, and something that could be in a way austere, but quite complex in how it changes throughout the day. These are some coming projects, but I'm gonna have to skip through them uh, so that we can conclude and make some questions. Uh, at the end, we engage in our projects with this type of graphics and processes, uh, talking about how we are gonna feel about them and um, bringing the previous experiences that we've learned from other projects into every single new uh, detail and every single new material. And I think that it's very important for me to say that as, as you pass on the S of the stability, you go into this S of success. And success can be actually quite, um, it could be an enemy because success is measured in our society with uh, exposure, with money, with, um, uh, with a lot of things that bring a lot of stress. And I think as an architect, when you have the opportunity to be successful with a practice, you can quit the responsibility of asking yourself how you want or why do you want to work and how do you want the work that you do be for the people that help you make that work? What is the experience for, the, for, for them as architects and persons? And that's when you create or have the opportunity of creating a culture that is not only going to follow and create a philosophy with you to the heart, but they will find means of developing their own uh, sense of being. And uh, it is very important because that I believe gets expressed in the empathy and the atmosphere of what we uh, of what we design and it's at the core of our practice today. At the end, I would like to uh, summarize that we, when we are asked, what do you do, whether you do stores or hotels or houses, I'd like to say we, we do atmospheres uh, or atmosphere detailed, which to me is uh, the materiality obtained from consciously crafting tectonic assemblies in the service of the uh, sensory experience. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for passing a few more minutes. Perfect. Uh, Michelle will read you some um, questions that we have. Um, so thank you so much, um, Goose. You're welcome. Your, your mic is off, Michelle. Thank you. OK, so I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one um, is coming in for how um, as your cultural identity affected your desire to become a designer? And then how has become being a minority in a rigorous career choice pushed you and motivated you? <laughs> it's complicated. I have to think this one through. Um, I don't know if it was my cultural identity what pushed me to become a designer. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to be creative since, you know, from, from a very early age. And when I thought of architecture, it was, you know, in a, in a certain way uh, natural. But I have to say that when I started architecture school, I knew very, very little or nothing about architecture. Um, so it's been a continuous discovery. And, in the sense of, I'm a, of, a, of being a minority, I was indeed a minority uh, in, in the US while studying and then while working. And, you know, I, I never made it an issue to me. Um, I, I, I believe it's easier to be a, a victim. I think, you know, I, I have to be thinking ahead. And, and I did have some uh, moments uh, where I had the opportunity of being the main designer for a veteran's home uh, for the state of California. So you could imagine that a Mexican uh, designer 
when, when I was presenting the project to the veterans or to the politicians, it was not very fun for them maybe to understand that I was Mexican, but I, I honestly didn't care. So I, I think you have to go beyond that. Uh, thinking of space is uh, universal. And one lesson there is you must know that in most cases, the client is who pays for the building, but not necessarily the one who uses it or the only one who uses it. There's, there's many clients or users, and that was the case. So I have to be thinking beyond that and uh, just let it sleep when things happen. <laughs> Thank you. And then the next one, um, what would you say would be um, one of your driving forces or driving passionate um, forces to kind of keep your um, passion going in your career? Um, and if you ever, um, do you ever find yourself stuck? Um, how do you kind of get out of that? I think a driving force is the fact that I, I get bored really quickly when we're doing the same. Uh, I, 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 I guess I'm a fan of change. Sometimes my team doesn't like that, especially before the deadline. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, architects, we need to be very curious all the time. We need to be investigating, researching, exploring. I like to be an explorer. Uh, recently, I, I was giving a psychological profile and I, I ended up being an explorer architect. And it made sense. <laughs> so it, we have to be seeing beyond what's offered to us easy from out of the shop. You know, when I was working in the U.S., and even when I was studying in ASU, I, I remember presenting my project for the first year studio uh, with Wendell Burnett, and I was doing some foreign place concrete in Arizona, and I wanted to put some iso isolation in between two, you know, two pours of concrete. And I remember uh, Wendell saying to me in the review, you, you need to have a lot of cojones, he said to me. <laughs> and everybody laughed out loud, and I said, well, it's just research into how to do it because I know not everybody does it here, but maybe it's possible. Let's just try to make it happen. Some of the systems by which we built some of our projects, I don't want to say they, they didn't exist before. I mean, nobody invents, you know, the black thread as we say in Mexico, but uh, they're not that standard. And, and you can make that happen. It's just that. How much do you want to push yourself to investigate and, and, and learn? Thank you. And um, another um, question coming in is, what is your favorite way of crafting um, with your hands to find inspiration? Woodworking, drawing, etc. cetera. I, I love sketching. Um, you know, I keep sketching, I keep reviewing the projects through the means of sketches and, and tracing over uh, other drawings. I have a hard time adapting to uh, <laughs> to the technology, not that we don't use it, we use it a lot, but I, I, the sketching is a great deal. As, as Victor, my friend would say, you know, it's, it's not just drawing, it's drawing, sketching and thinking, uh, right? And you're, you're connecting your mind and your heart with your sketching as you go through. And it's easy to make um, a lot of tries or a lot of experiments quickly. Whereas in some other means sometimes, or at least in my own experience, it, it, it takes much more time. Perfect, thank you. And then I'm gonna open this one up um, to um, Victor. Um, uh, he was gonna um, kind of just talk about, and so I'll let him ask this question on here. So Victor, I'm gonna open the floor to you. Okay, go ahead, Victor. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I was hoping we were going to read it. <laughs> Gustavo, un abrazo, mucho gusto. Um, hey, no, I think you answered my questions. They were mostly, I mean, I, I admire how the, you know, your drawings 
help framing your storytelling aspects of your projects. And I always love that, you know that. Um, oh yeah, I just wanted to ask you how we describe the design process and the role of your drawings in communicating your ideas. And then what do you find your inspiration? I know, I know you probably talked a little bit about it, but I want you to be more specific in the process of, of making not just the buildings, but you know, the behind the scenes, the, the, what we don't see, your daily, your daily routine and how drawing becomes part of that. I think our, our drawings are become much more important for the means of exploring possibilities of the assemblies or, 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 or portraying the notions of atmosphere that, that we're trying to explore but also to communicate that to the ones who are gonna help us make the things happen. Um, most of the, a lot of the drawings you saw had to do with these, you know, either sketches or diagrams about, you know, the materials coming together or potential details. And that's, that's ongoing. It comes to a point where one works or we agree that one works and that then, you know, becomes 3D models, uh, you know, construction documents. But in the meantime, we're back and forth with that. So there's, there's a, a very good amount of drawings uh, we do in that regard. And I, I, I strongly believe that the sketches have two powers. One, they communicate to the users or the clients that the projects are not closed to their ideas or longings. They are open-ended in that regard and they could you know, keep changing as we keep going in design. And also they, they communicate many things in one drawing. Sometimes a, a rendering maybe it's only about how it looks, but it's hard for it to become something about how it feels. That's, that's very, my very, very personal view. Thank you. Thank you, man. Okay, and then I'm gonna read this last one and I think that'll wrap up um, and get us closed out. Um, so it's coming in from um, Lucida Mil Mila. Um, thank you very much, Gustavo, for sharing your um, poetic pers um, perspective on architecture. How do you approach um, your assigning a role to the existing greenery on the site? For example, as you do for the trees in the Bosque house. Muchos gracias. I think when you, first thing, when you're given a project, you have to go see the site. You have to go many times and read the site in different times of the day, different moments, different seasons, because it, it gives you hints on what to keep or what to modify. Architecture is a very, aggressive act in itself. You know, we are violently modifying the landscape and the cities. So every time there's an opportunity of, of understanding there's a presence of a tree or a ridge or, or rocks or something, we try to keep it and integrate. Sometimes we, we embrace it with the architecture, sometimes we leave it to the side, but always thinking how they're gonna dance together uh, that, that game of uh, space, it, it comes with time. But my suggestion to you is uh, go draw the site, go draw uh, the sky, go draw something that is not architecture. Um, and, and be empathic or empathetic to things beyond architecture. Like I was saying at the beginning, people, place, food, music, that, that nurtures and feeds your intuition more and more, and then it comes out in your designs. Gustavo, thank you so much. Thank you. Jose. I hope you, you enjoy the, the reunion with Victor and Luis and all the group. Uh, we are um, going to close because we are in teaching mood. At 3 p.m., we should be uh, Arizona time in studio. Uh, Michelle, thank you so much for, for uh, joining us today. 
Michelle, as you know, is one of our students in the master, the new Master of Interior Architecture, and you brought here uh, this wonderful language about all of us doing this design for a um, tectonic assembly in the service of sensory experience, and I'm quoting um, materia here. Uh, we will continue in touch, and I wanted to use the opportunity to invite um, the, the, all the folks uh, already um, listening to us that next week we have our final lecture for this lecture series uh, with uh, Sonia Bouchard on um, topics related, completely different topic, but at the same time, very much related with your idea about relating with the larger cosmos. Um, and we will, we are already working very hard for the lecture series next year. So we hope yeah, you will continue there. Thank you, Gustavo. And I sincerely hope I will have um, dinner or lunch with you in Mexico City this fall. Mm -hmm but we have more students. Uh, our regard to uh, Luisa and the family, and um, we will continue the conversation. Thank, thank you, you very much, Jose, and everybody for joining. Thank you very much. Well, yes, thank we you. are delighted. Thank you so Bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Um, Ray, would you like to add something? All right, we are closing at goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.